Hello and welcome to Boots to Reboots, the place where most remakes come to die. What was that? There it is again. What's that noise? Watching the remake of Psycho is about as pointless as being present for my birth. Ultimately, the two products end up going nowhere. That's kinda harsh. I wrote that part. Psycho is one of the most iconic movies of all time, featuring one of the most iconic characters, score, <laughs> scenes, and ending. It is also directed by one of the most famous directors of all time, Sir Alfred Hitchcock. The movie is one of my all-time favorites and is still relevant even today. A&E currently has a show titled Bates Motel. So being that Psycho is a classic film directed by arguably one of the greatest directors of all time, why the hell would you want to remake it? An element that sets a remake up for failure is if there isn't anything wrong with the original to justify redoing it. And the main issue with this remake is if you're not going to bring anything new to it, then why even do it in the first place? Psycho is a film that starts out with a very precise setting. Phoenix, Arizona, Friday, December 11th at 2.43pm at Big Dick's Halfway Inn. At the hotel we meet Marion, who is our main character. For now. Something that is unique about the structure of this movie is that the person who you believe is the main character dies halfway through the movie. SPOILERS! We find out that Marion is sleeping with Sam Loomis, a recently divorced hardware store owner who is hurting for money. Sam Loomis and Psycho inspired the name for Michael Myers' psychologist in Halloween, Dr. Sam Loomis. Mm, yeah, okay, whatever. We are then taken to where Marion works. Did you notice the skinny guy getting poked by the fat guy in the hat? That's a homage to Hitchcock's cameo in the original. Hitchcock often had cameos in his movies and Psycho was no different. However, he wanted to get his cameo out of the way very early so people would pay more attention to the story instead of trying to search for him the entire time. And who is Hitchcock arguing with outside the window? Well, it's none other than the director of this remake. Quite fitting, actually. We learn that Marion works for a Mr. Lowry and is helping with the sale of a house, and Mr. Cassidy is buying a home for his daughter as a wedding gift. In the original it was $40,000, but here it's updated to $400,000 in cash. He was flirting with you. I guess he must have noticed my wedding ring. No. Also, this role was played by Hitchcock's daughter, Patricia, in the original. Here it's just played by some actress who can't act. Oh, Teddy called me, and my mother called to see if Teddy called. And, oh, your sister called to say that she'd be going to Tucson to do some buying, and she'd be going to Tucson. Mr. Lowry doesn't want that much money in the office, so he wants Marion to go put it in the bank. She's not feeling good, so she requests to go home after the errand. Things get interesting, though, because we then see her packing her luggage and then eyeballing the money. Don't you do it. Do it. Yeah, it seems she is tempted to take the money and run away to her boyfriend who is hurting financially after his divorce. While leaving town, she panics when her boss crosses in front of her car and notices her. She drives until she can't keep her eyes open and pulls over for the night. In the morning, she's woken up by a cop. Upon seeing who it is, she awkwardly tries to make a run for it, but the officer tells her to hold it. Already, we get a sense of what's wrong with this movie. It's exactly the same as the original. The shots are the same, and the actors are hitting the same marks that the original cast did. Ugh. It feels more like a film school exercise, and for being set in the 90s, the actors are delivering the dialogue as if they were back in 1960. <laughs> I declare. <laughs> the dialogue needed to be modernized a bit. <laughs> the officer eventually lets her go, but follows her because Marion was acting pretty suspicious. Marion stops off at a car dealership to switch cars, and wouldn't you know it, the officer shows up. Excuse me, sir. Your undercover skills suck. She can clearly see you. If you're going to be so obvious about spying on her, you might as well hide in the back seat of her car. One nice storytelling device is the use of narration while she's back on the road. 
We hear her boss talking to Carolyn about where Marion could be. Marion still isn't in? No, Mr. Lowry. But then she's always a bit late on Monday mornings. They contact Marion's sister, and we hear his conversation with Mr. Cassidy concerning his missing money. I'll get it back, and if any of it's missing, I'll replace it with her fine, soft flesh. I go back and forth on whether this is what happened back at the office, or it's just her playing the scenario out in her head. While driving, she runs into a bad storm and the rain is too much. In the distance, she sees the neon sign of a motel and pulls over. First off, I don't like the new Bates Motel sign. They could have chosen a better one. I also don't like the giant neon sign on top of the motel. The motel is supposed to go unnoticed by passing motorists. Not blind them while they drive by. Also, they changed the look of the house. If you're only going to make like four changes to the movie, don't change the things that are iconic symbols from the original. Go back to the original inspiration, the painting House by the Railroad by Edward Hopper. Anyway, Marion meets Vince Vaughn, who is trying to do his best Norman Bates impersonation. Do you have a vacancy? Oh, well, we have 12 in fact. 12 cabins, 12 vacancies. <laughs> she checks in under a fake name and Norman shows her to her room. Since it's late, Norman offers to make her some dinner. While he's gone, Marion hides the money in a newspaper and overhears an old woman arguing with Norman. As if men don't desire strangers, as if... Oh, I refuse to speak of disgusting things because they disgust me. You understand, boy? It appears his mother doesn't want some hussy in her house. I don't blame her. Again, if they're going to copy so much of the original, they should have used the dialogue audio from the original mother. Her voice was better. Oh, I refuse to speak of disgusting things because they disgust me! After the fight, Norman comes down with some sandwiches and decides they should eat in the motel's parlor. Marion offers the room, but for some reason, Norman hesitates. Already, we can tell something is wrong with Cabin 1. He hesitated when grabbing the key, had a hard time mentioning the bathroom. Uh, the, uh... Over there. And doesn't want to eat in there. In the parlor, we get a nice conversation between Marion and Norman, which gives us some backstory and character development. We learn a lot about these two from this scene, especially Norman. We learn that he practices taxidermy as a hobby, in fact, it's more than a hobby. Oh, well, it's more than a hobby. A hobby's supposed to pass your time, not fill it. We learn that Norman has a rough relationship with his mother and doesn't have any friends. Um, a boy's best friend's his mother. We see that Norman wants to leave and be happy, but is devoted to his mother. After Norman's father died when he was five, mother met a man who talked her into building the motel. When her lover died, it was too much of a shock for her. She had nothing left. Except you. A son's a poor substitute for a lover. Marion suggests putting her somewhere like a home, and it upsets Norman. A lot. What do you know about caring? Have you ever seen the inside of one of those places? The laughing and the tears and the cruel eyes studying you? My mother in there? We see a glimpse of the madness here in Norman, but he soon calms down. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes. <laughs> Anthony Perkins does a great job with this scene. He portrays Norman as weak and sympathetic, but with just a hint that something is wrong. They cluck their thick tongues and shake their heads and suggest oh so very delicately. Of course, I've suggested it myself. Vince Vaughn, however, overdoes it just a little bit. People always mean well. They cluck their thick tongues, and they shake their heads, and they suggest, oh so very delicately. His performance in this scene drew me in during the middle, but fell apart by the end. Here, Norman seems crazy. If I were her, I'd probably put down the sandwich and run for it, because this guy is probably going to kill me in the shower. Back in her room, Marion reflects on her current situation. Talking to Norman about personal traps has made her realize she just put herself into one and only she can get herself out. In the morning, she plans on going back to Phoenix to make everything right. Meanwhile, in the parlor, Norman takes a framed picture off the wall and looks through a peephole at Marion getting ready to take a shower. 
In the original, when we first meet Marion, she is wearing white while she's dressing. Later, when she's undressing, she's wearing black. This is symbolic of her stealing the money. It's little artistic touches like these that are missing in the remake. Also, the peeping scene is different in a bad way. In the original, Norman looks conflicted with himself, heads back up to the house, and sulks in the kitchen. In the remake, things get awkward because Vince Vaughn starts to spank his monkey. To me, Perkins was more curious, probably still a virgin. Whenever dirty thoughts popped into his head, Mother would take over and snuff them out before he could act upon them, to keep him innocent in a way. Here, Vince Vaughn is just a creepy pervert. Might as well change the name to Masturbates Motel. I mentioned earlier that the dialogue needed to be updated because people don't speak in that way anymore. It annoys me that they wouldn't update that, but would put more sexual material in there for modern audiences. It doesn't make the movie better, it in fact cheapens it. Aw, oh, oh, they went and did it again. Who's been jacking off on the wall? Ah, oh, ah, uh, ew. Ah, oh, ah, uh, oh, come on. Back in her room, Marion is doing some math, more than likely trying to figure out where she's going to come up with that four grand she spent. She tears up the piece of paper and flushes it down the toilet. Trivia! This shot in the original Psycho was the first time a toilet was shown flushing on camera. And this is a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the first time a toilet was shown flushing on camera. Marion hops in the shower to get clean. This symbolizes her washing away the wrongs now that she realizes she must go back. A shadowy figure can be seen through the shower curtain, slowly approaching her. The curtain is pulled back and... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Mother slips out of the room and leaves Marion to die a slow death as she crumbles to the floor. It almost feels surreal. Each cut in editing equals a stab, and the iconic violin score adds to the suspense. There's so much going on, but it's over so quickly. The aftermath, however, is completely silent besides the sound of the shower, and is paced much slower. The camera starts out on Marion's eye, slowly pulls back, dollies to the money on the nightstand, and then to the window for a shot of the house. Mother, oh God, mother, blood, blood. In the remake, the music is a little late on the scare. There's some weird sound effects and some random hallucination shots cut into the sequence for some odd reason. In the original, the mother was almost completely a silhouette. Here, mother is pretty well lit and it looks like they put Vince Vaughn, or whoever may be doubling for mother, in blackface to hide the not-so-secret secret. Norman runs to check on Marion and discovers her dead body. He's about to throw up. Norman grabs Marion's body and wraps it up in the shower curtain. He then puts the body, her luggage, and even the newspaper unknowingly filled with money in the trunk of Marion's car, which he dumps into the swamp. You get the sense that Norman isn't used to murder, but being the devoted son that he is, decides to clean up and hide his mother's crime. There's a nice little moment when he's dumping the car into the swamp. He's nervously nibbling on some candy and then panics when the car stops sinking. Your heart stops for a moment, because you sense his panic. But then the car continues to sink. In the remake, Vaughn is too smug with himself in dumping the car into the swamp. Norman should be nervous, not cocky that he's getting away with a crime. There should be no pleasure in it for him. 
The story then takes us to the store Sam works at and introduces us to Marion's sister Lila. She wants to speak to Marion and doesn't care about her stealing the money. Sam has no idea what she's talking about. He doesn't know where she is or anything about any stolen money. One difference between the two movies is that Julianne Moore plays Lila with more fire. She wants her sister found, damn it! Because yelling is caring. In the original, Lila seemed more concerned than she was furious. We are then introduced to Detective Arbogast, who is investigating the missing money, played this time by William H. Macy. He gives probably my favorite performance in the movie. Too bad he's only in a couple scenes. Arbogast then goes all around town seeking any information he can about Marion. He eventually stops off at the Bates Motel to see if maybe Marion stayed there. He questions Norman if he's seen Marion, and his story doesn't add up. It doesn't help that he seems really nervous. Look, Mr. Arbogast, I'm not lying to you, it's just that- No, 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 I, I know that. I know you wouldn't lie. Norman mentions his mother. Let's just put it this way, she might have made a fool out of me, but she didn't fool my mother. And Arbogast would like to question her. Norman refuses and tells Arbogast he better leave. Arbogast stops off at a payphone to tell Lila what he found out, and he then sneaks back to the motel. He heads off towards the house, goes inside, and up the stairs. Mother's bedroom door slowly opens, and in a beautiful over-the-head shot, Mother strikes again. <laughs> this causes Arbogast to awkwardly fall down the stairs, and he is then stabbed to death. If I had to pick one thing about the original Psycho that bugs me, it would be this shot. It's done using effects and just doesn't look right. Hitchcock probably wanted him to stumble more than fall down the stairs, but it comes off a little cartoonish. I'd rather see a stuntman take a nasty bump down the stairs. Also, we get some more of those random shots cut into the death scene. One of a blindfolded naked woman and another of a sheep on a stormy road? Why? Is the director trying to be deep or something? Let's just throw whatever shots we want in there. When they don't hear back from Arbogast, Sam and Lila decide to head to the sheriff's house to explain what's going on. While speaking to the sheriff and his wife, we learn some startling news. Nobody can talk to Mrs. Bates because she's dead. Orders are, nobody can see Mrs. Bates, not nobody, not know how. She poisoned her lover and then herself ten years ago. <sighs> back at the house, Norman heads into his mother's room because he wants to hide her in the fruit cellar. Fruit cellar? No, you hid me there once, boy, and you won't do it again. Sam and Lila go to the Bates Motel and pose as a traveling couple. Now, while in the car, you can tell that the background is fake. Either they wanted to stick that close to the original Psycho by using that old projection effect, or they're just lazy. These are things that are okay to update. If it looks goofy in an SNL sketch, it'll look goofy in your movie. Don't just look at Sam and Lila plan on sneaking off to search for Marion and question Norman's mother. While checking in, Norman detects that something isn't right. And although I don't like Vigo's cowboy version of Sam Loomis, I do like his performance in this scene better than in the original. Here he plays it more cool and jokingly. Hey man, we're just looking for a room. While in the original, Sam seems more aggressive. We know you have Marion. Where is she? You fucking fuck. Fuck. Lila noticed that the door to cabin one wasn't locked, so they sneak inside. The only thing they find is a piece of the torn up paper that Marion flushed down the toilet. Eric, gotta find clues to see if Marion was here. But this, a rapper. Aha! Found you. Yep, she was here, all right. Uh, uh, uh. They decide that Sam will distract Norman while Lila heads up to the house to question Bates' mother. Sam gives her the signal, and she heads on up. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. Lila heads upstairs into the mother's room, and it looks intact. The mother's impression is even still on the bed from where she was lying. 
She then heads across the hall into Norman's room and pokes around. It looks like a little kid's room. Again, I don't know why, but in the original, this comes off as sad, like Norman never grew up. In the remake, it comes off as creepy. It probably has to deal with Lila finding porn in Norman's room. Again, I wish they didn't make Norman out to be a pervert in this version. In an odd way, Norman in the original and the sequels comes off as a likable, sympathetic, yet tragic character. Adding the masturbation scene and pervert aspect takes away from Norman's likability. You could argue that he's a murderer and therefore you should feel nothing for him, but that's not true. Norman at heart is a good person. He suffered from a lot of psychological scarring while growing up and just went a little mad. Andy should know. Both his parents died while he was still in the asylum. They didn't want any more children after his outburst. His father bled out from a botched vasectomy. And his mother later drowned during her born-again baptism. Eventually, Norman realizes Sam is only distracting him and wonders where Lila went. Who is that girl that you came here with? They get into a struggle and Sam gets knocked out. Norman then runs up the stairs and into the house while Lila sneaks down into the cellar. In the cellar, she sees an old woman sitting in a chair with her back to the camera. In the remake, the spider crawling across her face is a nice touch, and I like the addition of the birds. The noise and imagery adds to the atmosphere. But in reality, if I was Norman, I'd be worried that the birds would just peck and poop on her. <coughs> on cue, Norman then runs in dressed up like his mother with knife in hand. Sam comes rushing in and is able to subdue Norman. I'm sorry, but when I saw Vince Vaughn in that wig and dress, I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> uh, fuck. However, Lila kicking Norman in the face is a nice touch. We then get some answers from the psychiatrist about what's going on. Turns out Norman is gone and the mother personality has completely taken over. The mother confessed to murdering Marion, Detective Arbogast, and two missing young girls. We also find out that Norman was the one who poisoned his mother and her lover. Norman felt guilty for what he had done so he took his mother's dead body and hid it in the cellar, even treated it with his taxidermy skills. But having her around wasn't enough so he started talking to her and even started responding for her. Whenever something threatened the illusion that his mother wasn't alive, the mother personality took over and took care of the threat. Now, weak, sympathetic Norman is gone and the mother has won the war. They'll see and they'll know and they'll say, Why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. To end the scene, we get a cool dissolve with the mother's skeletal face over Norman's, which is all in the original. The movie closes with a shot of Marion's car being pulled out of the swamp. Having watched these two films back to back, what do I think? <laughs> it was pretty pointless watching them one after another like that. When I finished the original, I might as well just went right back to the beginning and watched it over again. The problem is that there isn't anything new to justify seeing this remake. It's 95% the same movie, just different actors and shot in color. It probably would have been cheaper to colorize Hitchcock's Psycho and re-release it in theaters. Please don't do that. The original worked because of Anthony Perkins' performance and sadly Vince Vaughn can't fill those shoes. Not many actors probably could and it was just bad casting. Now in the book Psycho, Norman Bates is actually quite different from the way Anthony Perkins portrayed him. In the book, Norman Bates is a middle-aged, overweight drunk who wears glasses. The original screenwriter, Joseph Stefano, went with more of a boy-next-door approach and Perkins was cast as Norman. He felt the audience wouldn't feel any sympathy for an overweight, nerdy drunk. After seeing The Mist, I really liked the actor Toby Jones, and if I were to cast a Norman Bates closer to the book, he'd be up there on my list of actors. And it's ironic because he recently portrayed Alfred Hitchcock. To give this remake a purpose, it should have stuck more to the original source material. Maybe even borrow more from murderer Ed Gein, who Norman is loosely based after. Also, it's hard to do a remake of Psycho because it has such an iconic ending. 
Unless you've been living under a rock or are young and have the mindset that black and white movies are stupid, then you more than likely know that Norman Bates is the killer in Psycho. When I think of shocking endings to movies, there are four that come to mind. Spoilers. First off, Norman Bates dressed up like his mother and is the killer. Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. Bruce Willis is a ghost in The Sixth Sense. And the Jigsaw Killer is lying on the bathroom floor the entire time in Saw. Even if you haven't seen those movies, you probably know those endings through osmosis. Which is why the ending that shocked people 50 years ago doesn't shock them today. I feel like you can't change the ending, but it'd be nice if they tried harder to make you believe that maybe Norman isn't the killer, or maybe his mother isn't dead, like some of the sequels end up doing. But instead, this remake hits the exact same beats. Even the opening credits are the same. And that is the main reason why it fails. It's the exact same movie. I feel if Hitchcock were to give this film one compliment, it would be the opening shot. Hitchcock wanted a smooth helicopter shot of Phoenix that took you right through the hotel window into the couple on the bed. The footage was too rough, so this was done in multiple cuts. With technology being better, in this remake it's done smoothly in one shot like it was originally intended. Do yourself a favor and just watch the original instead. The original had that great black and white noir look to it, while the remake is a little too colorful for a horror film and a good number of the shots are overexposed. The final issue is the acting. The actors aren't so much acting as they are just trying to exactly imitate another person's performance. So the final question, does this remake deserve the boot? Although it could be considered an interesting experiment, ultimately it fails to deliver and now it's time to put it out of its misery. <laughs> this has been Boots to Reboots, the place where most remakes come to die. Thanks for watching. <laughs>